cooking up a simple batter. I can't remember the last time I felt such a familiar and unfamiliar sensation. A cup of coffee that's both hot and cold in the same sip? It's magical. But where did this come from? How is it possible? And how do you make it? And can this cup of hot and cold coffee surprise and delight the ultimate coffee critic, James Hoffman? I am absolutely terrified to find out. And that is today's video which starts by traveling back in time 20 years to 2004 when I was a young chef running Heston Blumenthal's experimental kitchen at the Fat Duck restaurant. It's when I developed my first three-star recipe, the hot and iced tea, and thixotropy is the secret to how it works. You might not know the word, but you're familiar with the phenomenon if you've ever smacked a bottle of ketchup to get it to flow. It's a strange property of certain liquids that they're thick and viscous when left undisturbed, but thin and flow when shaken or stirred. The more they're agitated, the more they liquefy. Less messy is the swirled pudding cup, a staple of school lunches. The vanilla and chocolate pudding stay apart because they're a fluid gel that's solid in the cup and becomes smooth and fluid in your mouth. Hmm. Enjoying the sensation of juxtaposed contrasting flavors is common in cooking. But enjoying the sensation of juxtaposed contrasting temperatures? That's far less common. This was the idea behind a pioneering dish created in 1999 at ground zero of the molecular gastronomy movement. El Bui's Sopa de Quisantes, 60 grados, 4 grados. The sensation of this dish is based on contrasting hot and cold temperatures of the same fresh pea soup. It's a clear example of how our mind perceives flavor and texture as being different when the only real difference is the serving temperature. The flavor and thickness change as you sip it down and go from the hot to the cold layer. It's no hot fudge sundae, but the contrast of temperatures is as delicious as it is memorable. It certainly stood out in Heston's memory from his meal at El Bui, and would be part of the inspiration for the hot and cold tea that we'd create a few years later at the Fat Duck. As a young chef back in 2003, I had become enamored with fluid gels, which were widely used to thicken our sauces at the Fat Duck because of their clean, crisp flavor release compared to the dull stodginess of starch-thickened sauces. And as a 90s kid, I was familiar with Orbitz. For those of you younger than me, this was kind of like boba tea for Gen X, a novelty beverage that was secretly a fluid gel. Unlike boba tea, where the tapioca pearls all sink to the bottom, the thixotropic nature of this fluid gel keeps the flavored beads suspended in the drink. But with just the slightest agitation of the bottle, the solid gel becomes water thin and the beads swirl. This was the lava lamp of beverages the ultimate fluid gel. I thought we could create something like this for the menu at the Fat Duck, but it was Heston who took the idea much further by connecting it to his memory of that dish from El Bui and giving me a doodle he'd made. Depicting a glass of English tea with a twist, it would be divided in half vertically with the hot tea on one side and iced tea on the other with no divider in the cup. My job? To figure out how the f to make this possible. The doodle was the easy part. The only thing that I knew for sure is that I would need to use the relatively obscure Jalang gum, isolated from a bacterium found in lily plants in a pond in Pennsylvania. Yes, Jalang gum is pond scum, but pond scum with the most extreme shear thinning behavior of any thickener. But from here, it was months of failure after failure. The tea itself needed to be adjusted to just the right pH and mineral content, or it wouldn't work. The gel and gum needed to be carefully blended into cold tea so that it didn't form lumps, or it wouldn't work. The mixture needed to be heated to just the right temperature to rehydrate the gel and gum, or it wouldn't work. 
before adding just enough calcium salt to get the gel and gum to gel, or it wouldn't work. If you don't get these steps right, and it is easy not to, nothing works. After this, it's best if the solution is stirred continuously as it cools, so that it becomes a fluid gel. Stirring keeps the particles of gel so small that you cannot perceive that the fluid is actually made up of a countless number of tiny pieces of solid gel. Of course, the tea needs to be thickened as little as possible, because tea isn't thick. But the tea cannot be so thin that the convection currents from the temperature differences between the two sides flips the hot tea on top of the cold tea. And if you can feel the temperature difference between the sides when you hold the cup, the spell is broken. After months of experimentation, I'd finally figured out how to make Heston's hot and cold tea. Eureka! It tastes, well, like tea, but this side is Earl Grey, hot, and this side is iced tea, and you taste and feel both at the same time in the same sip. It's really difficult to describe how strange this feels. You can rotate the cup 180 degrees and the hot and the cold side flip. You can sip from the hot side or the cold side, and there's no divider in the cup. Eventually, the temperatures between the two sides will equilibrate, and it's over. It's a fleeting moment of magic. This dish is a party trick, of course, and not something you'll end up craving every day. But it's also whimsical and fun at a time when fine dining was stuffy and too serious. This kind of cooking isn't just about nourishment. It's about the art of what's possible. And like modern art, it's not everyone's uh, cup of tea. This video was the first time that I'd made the hot and iced tea recipe since 2006 or so. I'm no longer living and cooking in England. I haven't cooked professionally in about a decade. I live in Seattle now and make YouTube videos like this and design cooking tools like the combustion predictive thermometer and giant grill gauge. More about those at my website combustion.inc if you're interested. That's the day job that pays to make these videos. But for today's video, I thought it would be interesting to see if we could adapt the recipe to coffee. But critical feedback is really important when developing a recipe like this. So for my cup of hot and cold coffee, I know the perfect person for that feedback. My longtime London friend and famous coffee YouTuber, James Hoffman. Good morning, James. It's great to see you. Hey, Chris. How are you doing? I am just waking up. How are you doing? I am done with coffee for the day, but uh, <laughs> not bad. Not bad. Did you, did you get my package of white powders? Yes. You'd think I'd be used to receiving random white powders in the mail, but it's still it's still always like, okay, thanks. But yes, I have received the white powders uh, and the instructions therein and have run the experiment. So tell me what, what you got, what happened? How'd it work? It didn't work. Um, couple things, couple things. Um, the, the sort of major and the minor, we'll go with that. The major is, I don't really know why, but it's almost like the the it just didn't gel, right? It's it's like it didn't hydrate properly, it didn't dissolve properly. And and I'm definitely hitting the temperatures required for that to hydrate. And that's my other kind of uh on this one, where yeah. I'm cooking coffee to get this done and it does not smell good. Yeah. Like it it doesn't, you know what I mean? The result so the resulting thing didn't set up, didn't gel, and then tasted bad. Um hmm. so so not, not, <laughs> um, not quite a success. So, but not totally unexpected. This was what I was worried about. You know, I'm in Seattle. You're in, you're in England. I used to live in England. So your water's quite hard compared to ours. There's a lot more mineral content. You're, you're a country built on chalk. Um, yeah. And <laughs> in every way, you almost certainly have more mineral in your water than I do. We have relatively soft water and that can keep gel and gum from hydrating. But the right. other problem is everybody's coffee is going to be a bit different. How they brew it is going to be a bit different. It's strength, it's acidity. Yeah. You know, so what would be ideal is if we could get the gums into the water first and then make the coffee. Right. Ultimately, it feels like what you want to do is just add some very strong coffee to that. And so the first thought would be something like espresso. But espresso is going to be just vi like violently unpredictable in terms of how people make it at home. Uh, it might be the right kind of concentration and strength for this, but it's just a massive, it's a massive variable. 
And also, it's, it's hard to make, it's expensive to make. So I guess a solution would probably be something like uh, like a good coffee extract, ultimately, like a, like a, like a finished extraction. Um, at, at, at sort of the cheapest end, I, I suppose you could use something like just straight instant coffee, though I don't think that would be particularly delicious. And then I guess at the other end, you've got something like Cometeer who are doing like specialty coffee extracts. And so you could use like the little, you know, just melt the frozen puck of Cometeer, which is finished extracted coffee, and use that because that's about 13% strength. So it's very strong. It's stronger than normal espresso. So diluting that would be relatively easy and it would at least be, between you and I at least, extremely reliable, consistent, I guess. We'd have the same experience for testing and development. Let me do that. I'll send you a new recipe and let's try this again. Sounds good. Fantastic. Right, speaking of it. After my call with James, I went back to the drawing board. The problem was consistency. Different coffee beans, different roasts, different brews, different mineral content in the water. All of these factors were affecting the gel and gum's ability to create a fluid gel. Not to mention, we were having to abuse good coffee by boiling it to get the gel in into solution. But James's suggestion to use a coffee concentrate was a good way of overcoming these problems. What if we could standardize both the coffee and the water? Enter Comtier, frozen coffee concentrate. This solution allows us to hydrate the gel and gum first and then add the coffee later once the fluid gel has cooled. It's much more reliable, much better for the coffee flavor, and frankly, much easier for anyone to make. Here are the steps. First, measure out ice cold water. If you have hard water, use bottled water that doesn't have a really high mineral content. Then weigh out the gel and gum for two solutions, one with 0.1% gel and gum by weight of water for the iced coffee, and one with 0.15% gel and gum by weight of water for the hot coffee. Disperse the gel and gum into the cold water. Cold water and a small electric whisk helps prevent lumps. Heat the mixture to a boil. It should go completely clear, indicating the gel and gum has rehydrated. Thaw some comb tier coffee. Then pour the comb tier coffee concentrate into the fluid gels. Then cool the mixture. I have the equipment to stir continuously, but assuming you don't, you can just cool it over an ice bath and then pass the solid gel through a fine sieve to break it up. While the fluid gel is cooling, you'll also need a divider to split your cup in half while you're pouring the fluid gels. I fill my glass with a 1% gel and solution in water and then demold and slice it to create a template, which I can trace onto some cardboard to create a very snug fitting divider for my cups. Finally, to serve it, heat the hot coffee fluid gel to 150 Fahrenheit, about 65 Celsius, and keep the cold coffee fluid gel on ice so that it's just above freezing. To serve, pour the hot and cold coffee fluid gels onto either side of a divided cup, remove the divider, and then enjoy. Mm. That is much better. And the coffee flavor is a lot better too. I think this recipe is ready for James to try again. And I really hope it works because if this doesn't work, it might be hopeless and you will never see this video. Hey James, thanks for giving this another go. I, I, I'm just about to pour it. I've not tasted yeah. this yet. Okay, I've not messed it up. That looks, where are you, here you go. All right, out comes the divider. I've not tried this yet. This will be my first taste, because I wanted to taste it with you. Okay, are you ready? I'm, I'm officially nervous. So it gelled. It, looked, it looks good. It looked gelled nicely. Smells good. Ooh. Sort of, it's almost like one nostril gets the hot side. All right, cheers. Wait, you want me to drink down the split, right? Half, half? Yeah, down the split is what I recommend. Oh, that's weird. Oh, that's fun though. No, no, that's fun. That's like, it's it's so abnormal that, it, but it's just the novelty of it's huge fun. Cause you, you can drink like an Irish coffee, which is hot coffee and cold cream on top and you get yeah, the yeah. two things at once. But this does not, does not feel like that. This feels no. like, like the, the, the sides of your mouth is split in half. And so this, this cheek got the cold side. 
It's so weird. Uh... <laughs> it's like cold on my teeth and hot on my... It's weird. It's so weird. It's tasty. The coffee tastes nice. It's... it's um... Oh god, yeah, yeah, the coffee tastes good. Like, because we brought it up to just up, up like 60, 65. And generally I found that if you bring coffee just to where you want to drink it, it's great. And if you take it hotter than that and bring it back down, it sucks. Um, so that worked really well. The cold side tastes nice. That's just genuinely, that's just a ton of fun. I, like that's just, you've not had that before. Here's a new thing. No. Here's a cup of coffee you've never had before. In like in a sentence, like what, what how would you, how would you succinctly describe what you just had? It, it's slicing your head in half and giving them two different drinks. Well, there's something you don't get to try every day. That's true. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to just go and make this now for the team here because I think they're going to really enjoy it. Uh, uh, fantastic. And and so, James, thank you again. Thanks for, thank for, you. for being a good sport about this. And I look forward to catching up hopefully next time in London. It's good to see you. You too. All right. Thanks, Chris. Okay. <sighs> he liked it which is a huge relief. I was genuinely nervous about having James Hoffman try my hot and cold coffee, especially since he had to prepare the recipe. I couldn't make it for him. But if he liked it, what do real people think? And that's the final thing we need to do. We need to let the people speak. So I've arranged with my local coffee shop, Santo, in Seattle to have their customers try my hot and cold coffee. Let's go. It shocked me. Like I saw the separation, yeah. but didn't think it was going to be hot and cold because I just grabbed it because yeah. it's not in a glass where I can really feel it. Sensory confusion. I have cold on this side of my face and hot on this side of my face. You get cold iced coffee on one side and hot on the other. What is this, this magic that you coffee. created? That is so fascinating. That's a weird experience in my mouth. But I don't like them together. You don't like them together? No, I like them separate. That's really interesting. Like one side of my mouth is fully hot and then the other it's like cold. It's really good. It's, it's really trippy though. Can yeah. you say thank you so very much for watching and see you next time? Yes, thank you so much for watching. See you next time. <laughs>